Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing the Williams Company stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. The Williams Company's core business is natural gas processing and transportation. The company helped to get the modern telecommunications industry off the ground by running fiber optic cable through its decommissioned pipelines. It built two nationwide networks, which subsequently spun off into separate companies in 1995 and 2001. The company is headquartered in Tulsa, Oklahoma and was founded in 1908. The ticker trades on the New York Stock Exchange, Deutsche Börse, Zicha, Vienna, Sao Paulo, and London Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 38 billion market cap. They're trading at $32 a share and they have 1.2 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see their free cash flow goes up each year from 1.5 billion to 2.8 billion. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that's positive each year. It doubles from 2019 to the trailing 12 months. Revenue is a sales for the company. And that goes up nicely from 8.2 billion up to 10.5 billion. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. And that's pretty steady from 3 billion up to 3.1 billion. Even though their revenue is going up, their gross profit is pretty steady, which is not a good sign. That means their margins are getting worse. Below that is their operating expenses. These are all the expenses not directly related to generating the revenue. Gross profit minus operating expenses gives you your operating income. And that's up a little bit from 2.4 billion to 2.5 billion. Once again, their operating margins are getting worse. A lot worse in 2019 compared to the trailing 12 months. They spent 1.2 billion of interest on their debt, which is pretty consistent year to year. Then you have other income and expenses. These are all the gains or losses not part of the company's core operations. Your pre-tax income, your taxes, and the bottom line of the income statement is your net income, which is up a lot from 2019 and 2020. 1.5 billion in the trailing 12 months, almost 1.6 billion in 2021. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. So they generate a good amount of cash flow over 4 billion in trailing 12 months. Then your CapEx investments in property, plant, and equipment. They spent a lot of CapEx in 2019 over $2 billion. And they've been averaging 1.3 billion a year after that. When they have to construct a pipeline, the cost of that pipeline goes into CapEx and it's carried on the balance sheet and depreciated over its useful life. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. They did have low free cash flow in 2019 because of their big CapEx spend. It's highest in the trailing 12 months at 2.8 billion. They do pay a dividend with their free cash flow. In the trailing 12 months, they paid down 900 million of debt. They added 1.3 billion, paid down 2.1 billion. In 2019, they also paid down some debt. In 2020, they added a similar amount of debt as they paid down. And in 2021, they added more debt than they paid down. Let's look at the capital structure. 11 billion of equity, 22 billion of debt. They're 34% equity, 66% debt. So they are a bit leveraged. Their net debt is 22 billion. And their WAC on Finbox ranges from 6.8% to 8%. I use the middle number of 7.5% and that's the discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 51 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using a weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $47 billion. We divide that by 1.2 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $38. They're trading at $32. So they're trading at an 18% discount. It's a buy according to the model. 
Their revenue forecast for 2024 is 10.4 billion. For 2023, it's 10.9 billion, and for 2022, it's 10.6 billion. And I continue this trend into 2025, and I got 9.8 billion. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. They convert on average 25% of their revenue into free cash flow, so I multiplied their future revenue estimates by 25%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. If you go to the website Simply Wall Street, their valuation is $32. They're saying the stock is 2% undervalued. So they're saying it's pretty much trading at intrinsic value. There are 14 analysts that price this stock and the average price target is $39.29. The lowest price is $36 and the highest price is 42. This is where the stock has been trading the last five years. A couple weeks ago, it was trading higher than its pre-COVID levels. There are lots of oil and gas stocks still trading below their pre-COVID levels. And when COVID hit in March 2020, it got to a low of $11, and it almost hit $40 a couple weeks ago. It's come back down to 30. But they still pay their consistent dividend. They have not reduced their dividend at all which is still an important part when you invest in an oil and gas midstream company, getting that dividend payment. The price of Brent crude is up 142% in the past five years. This stock is pretty much flat in the past five years, while the midstream ETF ENFR is down 12%. So for about three and a half years, all three investments were pretty much tracking each other, but Brent crude really took off while these stocks increased slightly. They pay a quarterly dividend. It was 30 cents in 2017. It's up to 43 cents, a yield of 5.4%, which is 73% of their free cash flow, 136% of their net income. This is their dividend yield since 2011. Look how high the dividend got in 2016, 14%. The stock price must have crashed that year because I don't think they raised their dividend that much. The dividend got close to 10% in 2020 when the stock came down a lot. And the forecast is for the yield to be 5.9% by 2024. The last time they did a stock split was 10 years ago, a 5 for 4. Then they did a 10 for 9 in 2001, a 2 for 1 in 97, a 3 for 2 in 96, and a 2 for 1 in 93. They have a beta of 1.19, so the stock is a little more volatile than the market. It's gone up 18% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is down 12%. The 52-week low is 24, the high is 38, and the stock is trading between its 50-day and 200-day moving average. This is a really popular stock. Over 12 million shares are traded each day. Almost all the shares outstanding are on float. 87% are held by institutions, and 1.5% of the shares are shorted. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you'd have $19,000 today. That's a 94% return, a 7% annual return. The CEO's salary is $1.3 million and their total compensation package is $14 million. It was $16 million in 2020 and about $6 million in 2016. There's only been one insider trade in the past 12 months, a sell for 36,000 shares. And this person sold it at $38, so they're pretty happy now since the stock price is lower. 86% of the companies held by institutions, 13% by the general public, 0.3% by insiders, and a small amount by the government and private companies. Their employee count has been going down over the years. They had about 6,200 employees in 2016. They're down to 4,800. The biggest shareholder is Vanguard at 10%. BlackRock is the second biggest at 9.3%. State Street, Dodge & Cox, Geode, Managed Account Advisors. Then Reef America, their parent company is Deutsche Bank. Clearbridge Investments, JP Morgan and Franklin Resources. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to companies in the same industry. There are 59 companies in the same industry as Williams. And if Williams has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. They spend more than average in CapEx, 1.3 billion, average is half a billion. Their debt to equity ratio is better than average, but they still have $2 of debt for every dollar of equity. Their yield is a little higher than average, 5.4%, average is 4.4%. Look at MPLX, 11.6%. They do generate more free cash flow than average, but you can see they generate less free cash flow as a percent of their market cap as the average.
They rank fifth in market cap of all the companies. The Canadian company Enbridge is first. Their price to book and price to earnings are better than average. Price to free cash flow and price to sales are worse than average. They do generate more revenue than the average company. Look at energy transfer, 71 billion. They generate the most revenue. This is the only stock I own on the list, energy transfer. Their five year annual revenue growth rate is 6%, average is 10%. ROA less than average, ROE higher than average. ROE is net income over equity. So to summarize, I have them trading at an 18% discount. Midstream stocks are pretty safe investments. You're not gonna two or three X, but you should get a consistent return over the years, mainly through the dividend. And they've been around a really long time, well over 100 years. So they're definitely not going anywhere. I rank their free cash flow seven out of 10, their revenue seven out of 10, and their ratio six out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.